Hey everyone, it's Derek G. It is Derek G Speaks Volumes, the podcast where I take a thesis, have a thesis on music and culture and the influences it impacts on our own lives every single week. And I hope you're well. We have a really interesting episode that I think will upset me as much as it might upset you in terms of whether or not it's nature or nurture, our music taste, where does our music taste come from and how much is it up to us and our own opinions and feelings and how much are we actually externally influenced? How impressionable are we to our music taste and whether or not we actually like the music that we rock in our earbuds every day or is it just a bunch of environmental factors that kind of get us to where we are. I hope you are well. I'm doing well. I'm running on a little less sleep than usual. So hopefully I don't ramble too much. If you like what you hear, if you like what I do, like the pod, subscribe, do all the bits, star all the things because it all helps. And it, I appreciate it very much. So why am I exploring this? I've been thinking about this a bit recently about we all have our eclectic music taste. We all tend to say that we like everything, but it goes without saying that there are so many environmental factors that go into our music taste that we probably don't think about that I wanted to explore nine, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different factors that go into our music taste and influences that we probably don't think or attribute to that often. Some of you, them, you will, some of them you won't. Now, before I get into the top nine, it, this doesn't mean that having influences and being impressionable over music is a bad thing. It's totally uh, normal. But I think that we often think that our music taste is kind of singular to us, but a, a lot of the cases, there are external factors that really drive home and influence to you so that you like it, whether you like it or not. Does that make sense? Let's go with number one, the most and most obvious one would be the influence of older siblings or cool friends. Did I have that myself? Less so. I tried to imbue that uh, on my little brother who's 10 years younger than me. I tried to give him a hard drive of all my music, my ripped CDs, my MP3s, and be like, this is what you will like. This is good music. And I think he proceeded to ignore it and use it as an external hard drive, which he very good. But I, I know, and we all know, and, or perhaps you are one of those people that you're like my older brother, my older sister had the coolest music taste. And I just listened to what they listened to because I thought they were cool. I did have an uncle. I do have an uncle that listened to alternative music and he is 10 years older than me. And he was definitely someone where I was like, damn, he knows things I don't. He's cool. And he they, he even introduced me to a group called Regurgitator, which is uh, a, an Australian, uh, I guess, alternative rock band from the 90s that I definitely was into for a huge amount of time because of him. Looking back, you know, they have their high and low points, more low points and high points, but I definitely was obsessed with them because of him. And then Cool Friends, there was a guy when my parents had a cafe that they, my parents hired who came from New York and introduced me to hip hop. And I just loved it because he introduced me to it. He burned some CDs for me of Diggable Planets, Tribe Called Quest, Deltron 3030, maybe one more. And it didn't matter what he put on there. I was like, I want to like this because this guy is like what I hope to be one day. He had a hot girlfriend. He wore like a grandpa cap in a really cool way. You know what I mean? So, the the foundation of my hip hop love came from the desire to be emulate what this guy was like. Number two is the fear of missing out and or just fitting in generally. So people are on something, people are talking about it, your peers, your colleagues, and you don't want to feel lame. You don't want to feel like you have missed out and you are just someone that is old and irrelevant. So you start to go to these gigs with them. You start to go to parties. You start to club with them. Maybe they play it in the office. Maybe you play it, they play it in the car. And because you don't want to be someone that is left behind, you start to listen to it. And maybe it starts to become an earworm and it builds something in your head of like, okay, 
they have played this enough where I'm starting to like it. I can imagine a lot of people that might not like dance music start liking dance music that way, where people drag you along begrudgingly and you might have listened to emo and suddenly you're listening to techno because it's all part of the world that you want to fit in and be part of. I need to say, and I need to say it again, this is none of this is bad, but obviously is an external influence that kind of forces you into an environment which is which is combining things like you know, alcohol or illicit drug consumption, as well as partying, as well as good times, as well as friendships, which makes you like it even more. The third external influence in the nurture or nature of music is cultural signifiers, which are huge because often this is people that provide context, people that give a stamp of approval that is good, whether it's a celebrity, whether it is endorsement from a radio station, whether it is another artist. Sometimes we look to these people because we aspire to be like them, where we admire them to, to lead us, lead the way. So whether you are LeBron James, whether you are Selena Gomez, you might not listen to a particular type of music, but Selena Gomez says that she likes it and therefore there is an entry point for you to get into this music and get into this world and for you to appreciate it on a lot of level where you wouldn't have done it before. And hey, I'm part of that. I am what people consider a tastemaker or DJ whereby you might not like Turkish psych, but because I think you should check it out, then you will check it out. And because you know that I like it, your brain is more open-minded to liking that music as well. I think I have gone down an impressionable path before where there has been an artist who has recommended music and I think I've listened to it and I've liked it and I've decided I've liked it. I've listened to it and play, I've added it to playlists and then thought about it some more and after a while of listening to it and it would come up in a playlist again and I'm like, I don't actually like this. Why? Where did I find this? Why do I like this? But it does become part of your DNA for a little bit because you want to feel like you get it because you get this person that has given you this stamp of approval as well. That leads me to the next point around radio, which is radio less and less uh, is a cultural signifier of anything, but repetition is hugely important, whereby especially before streaming, but I guess it's the same, streaming has playlists, streaming has those automatic discovered weekly or those sort of playlists, but radio in particular, it's all about the earworm. It's all about introducing you to music that has been filtered through multiple commercial radio filters, whether it's through the record label, whether it's through streaming numbers, to the point where the radio station, the radio station has a finite amount of songs that they promote every single week. And they only add maybe like five songs a week and the rest of it is the main rotation that keeps going. Where you get to the point where there's a song from Miley Cyrus that you'll just hear whether you like it or not. And Flowers, you hear it for the first time and you probably thought it was unremarkable. You hear it for the hundredth time, you're singing along with it and you know every part of it and it's your favorite song of the year. Repetition is such an underrated influence in people's music taste. And I think that the pop, pop, the the end of the line pop music, which is the, the richest side of music where you've got Ed Sheeran and the weekend and Miley Cyrus and Selena, Selena Gomez operates under the reliance on a whole lot of repetition. Because one could argue, I'm not sure if the experiment would work, that if you played a song that is not major label focused and not, a bit more interesting and you played it enough, people would probably like it. It would be almost worth the experiment where you put a song in a radio, commercial radio rotation that is not commercial radio friendly and you played it enough and you saw what happened if you could move the needle and turn the taste of the general populace. But by design, radio stations try to regress to the mean and play the stuff that is the most likable. So it's not there to challenge you, but the repetition of the type of sound that people like and the friendly things to their ears means that you have what people call mainstream music that people generally hate. But Ed Sheeran can sell at a 100,000 person stadium, which is very, very rare. And I think that that only happens because of radio. The fifth reason in your impressionable state is burned in memories. Because I can tell you a personal story about listening to music 
with my dad in the car at home, specifically the Bee Gees, specifically ABBA, specifically Moby. He had a Moby era, I guess that was early 2000s, where he listened to that all the time. And I went through a phase in my rebellious phase when I was in my teens where I hated that stuff, but now I love it because it means more to me than just the music itself. If I hadn't experienced the Bee Gees at all, I don't know if I would have been into the Bee Gees, but now certain Bee Gees just gives me a feeling that is beyond the music itself. And thank you, Dad, for, for that influence. But it goes to show that sometimes people associate the music that they love to a time in their life and whether they like it or not is less to do with their taste and less to do with whether they will listen to it on the day to day, but because it is relevant to an era that was significant to them that they want to relive in their head. It's like Moby. I don't know if I like Moby, but I can put it on and I'm experiencing 20 plus years of my life in one go. And that can only be a good thing, but if my dad hadn't bled play from the car speakers, then I highly doubt I would be a Moby fan. Speaking of burned in memories, I think that other techniques to do that are uh, blends or remixes. You see DJs who might blend together a hook from an Ice Spice song with a techno song, and that you might not listen to Ice Spice, but then when you hear it at the club under over the top of a techno song, you might go, hold on, what is this? I like this. And it kind of brings you to this level where I would never listen to pop music, but I Spice is playing and I'm in a club in Berlin and this is crazy and, and gives you, or, or I guess recontextualizes a song that you would never experience to the point where you can enjoy it in another setting. And then that takes you back to that song and you want to relive that memory by enjoying the song that you wouldn't have been introduced to in the first place. Similarly, Songs might represent a certain movement, a certain time, whether it's political, whether it's a protest, whether it's American Idol, and you love revisiting that time because it represented who you were and what you were at that time. And that was the song that signified that time. This next one's fairly obvious and fairly fun, which is you are influenced by rebellion as a form of motivator for your music taste. So look at the best example of this. If you're a goth, if you are a punk, if you are into hardcore, if you are into metal, if you are into industrial, usually generalizing, but usually these types of people like stuff that is more subversive, darker, harder to understand. And you are in society, maybe someone that is a bit left of center and a bit more of an outcast, and you want to find your own crowd that doesn't listen to the mainstream. So the end, you end up finding, identifying music that is darker, more subversive, more unusual. And do you therefore like that music or does the music define who you are at that point? Because sure, we've all been through it. We have those emo phases in life where the... You know, in my era, it was probably Linkin Park and such, where that's not by any means subversive, but it was like pop subversive, where if you weren't into the happy Britney Spears side of thing, you're into Linkin Park because you don't understand who I am and I feel so numb and that music is there for them. That is what music is designed for. Not everyone is so impressionable. I can't be so cynical to say that you can't like that music because you're only liking it because you want to be a rebel, but it's designed to capture people that are looking to be heard. And that voice is not there in Britney Spears and NSYNC. It is there because someone is screaming to the mic, Chester Bennington saying that you feel so numb. I think like anything where you're impressionable around a particular movement of sound because of the psyche of who you are at the time, and you don't develop any other styles or tastes of music can make you quite narrow in your taste and point of view. Because I know for myself, I had an aversion to pop music because I wanted to be alternative. I wanted to be different. And therefore I didn't like or poo pooed anything that was considered mainstream and therefore uh, turned my nose up to things that I would look back on now and kind of missed because I didn't want to give it the time of day because I thought it was lame and I thought it was basic and I thought it was cookie cutter and is restrictive and elitist in its own way. Interrupting the podcast to introduce the sponsor for this week, turntablelab.com is the website, is the partner if you don't know anything about them, if you're an audio enthusiast or a beginner 
and you need anything regarding hi-fi, whether it's speakers, cables, weights for your turntables, platters, a slip mats, that's all there for the taking. And then they also have the lab, which is their vinyl store as well, where they have over 100,000 records. So you can go there once you've picked up all your hi-fi needs to pick up some records. The four or more deal, buy four or more records, get 10% off. Even better, right? And you can take those discounts all the way to pay for your postage and all that. So if you want to check out more, turntablelove.com, or you can go to turntablelove.com forward slash Derek for my selections of things that I like on the website as well. That is the sponsor. Back to the episode. Number seven in your impressionable ways, and probably my favorite of the list, is lust. Is pining for an artist because you find them attractive, sexually appealing, and is the ultimately in many ways is the top one or two functions of pop music, which is to lure you in because you might be young and horny and, and wanting to look to this ethereal pop star figure that they've designed for you at the age of 14 years old. But I think that that is a huge, probably the hugest influence in terms of an impressionable music taste to get you into something that you might normally not be into. I think that the perfect example of that is obviously K-pop. Everyone is super attractive. Some, not all, have plastic surgery. There are, for the boy groups, there's a ton of female fans. In terms of girl groups, there's a ton of male fans. And obviously the labels, the artists know what they're doing. That's not to say kind of ugly pop stars, but I think that ever since what Elvis and the Beatles, has there been the artist that sells records and moves people because of how they look. It's because of how they move, because of the charisma, their riz, <laughs> that people are attached to and obsessed with and sells. Sex sells. Now, have I been a victim of that? Let me think. Sure, for sure. I <laughs> I had a Mandy Moore single when I was younger, believe it or not. Did I like the music? I can't even remember what the song is, so clearly not really. But it was about the fact that it was Mandy Moore. J-Lo, for sure. Britney, sure, to an extent. You know, you say like, oh, Britney was great and it was really cool and really good music. But let's be real. When you're young and wanting to look for that sort of thing, of course, on the other side, what do you have? You had uh, Enrique Iglesias. You had Ricky Martin. Who do you have now? Take your pick of the slew of hot things that are out there to take your fancy. It is the number one thing. And I think that of all the ones that I have listed so far is the one that really compromises me, people's music taste where you care less about the music, to be honest, especially with music videos. You could care less about the song. You just want to see that music video. You want to pine over them and you want to get the poster that comes with the record or whatever, power to the industry, sex sells, they make money. I think most people, most people grow out of it, I hope. Number eight in the impressionable list of music taste is the collective opinion. This one is interesting. This one can be dangerous. This one is probably my least favorite on the list, which is publications, books, Rolling Stone, Pitchfork, different places that say these are important. You should care about this because these are the greatest of all time. Now, uh, for me, having had and owned the Rolling Stone Top 500 Albums of All Time book, I was impressionable in that. And I definitely listened to and took seriously the top 100, at the very least, records that they were recommending and tried to listen to as many as possible to the point where my best thing, my best kind of reference for it would be Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. I think Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys is a cool record, but at the time in the early 2000s, that record was considered in the top three, I think, records of all time. And I believed it, but kind of squinting. I kind of believed it like this. I was like, this is a great record, but it really wasn't for me. It, I, I like Caroline No, I like God Only Knows, but I think to whoever was reviewing stuff at the time, they were like, oh, the experimentation of it, the psychedelia of it, the, the fact that it was the American Beatles meant that it was an incredible, one of the greatest records of all time. I don't like that record, really. I have to say, looking back, it's fine. It's fine, but I, I needed to like it and I had to like it because the consensus at my impressionable young age was that it was the, the, the greatest, one of the greatest albums of all time, right? So... 
that's where I was left with a uh, series of lists that I had no idea how to filter my own opinion through because I didn't have enough of a formed opinion around. Some people identify all of their music taste around those lists and stick by them. And you'll see things like, well, of course, Kendrick Lamar's whatever album is the best of all time because everyone says so. And it's like, but who cares? And maybe your favorite album of his is the one that everyone else hates. And that favorite is different to best and best is not even a fact. It's just subjective. But I think that this can scare a lot of people away in their opinions or turn this hive mind of people that are firmly convinced that my beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy is the greatest Kanye West record with no other debate because it has to be. Of course it is because everyone agrees that it is. The last in the list, the ninth in the list of impressionable music influences would be stories, which I think is a nice one. It's a nicer, more warm hearted influence, which is stories that you come across where you relate to the plight, the journey of the artist to get where they are. For instance, these aren't the best examples because they're quite obscure. There was an artist called Lewis which was an artist, I can't remember where he's from, but basically someone found his record and he was some like almost ghostly artist that no one could find anything about except for this album that he was, it was this white cover and he was like, he almost looked like a Ken doll. It was really ethereal and it had music that was really ethereal. And he represented this mystery person that was elusive that you could not really fathom where they're from and turns this record into more of a mythological experience for anyone that might come across this record so therefore you are more bound to the story of lewis than perhaps you are in favor of the music similarly with donnie and joe emerson the story of brothers who put out a record and the parents took out a loan in order for him to put out his record in the 70s or early 80s i want to say fell into obscurity because no one cared about it and then someone discovered the song baby in the early 2010s and now they are finding their way and i think a lot of people are inspired by their story and inspired by their sound now who trades off this the most i would say america's got talent and places like that where the story is so much more important than the music say in britain's got talent you've got susan boyle what do you really care about there you care about this unassuming lady that is a bit strange that comes on stage and has an operatic voice that just blows everyone away. The visual appeal of a story, a feel good story means that the Susan Boyle CDs are in every thrift store around the world because everyone of a certain age bought a Susan Boyle CD because they just loved the story, loved her journey and wanted to support her. And she made so much money. Well, I don't know if she did or her, whoever was behind her did. And the storytelling narrative of Susan Boyle can really, really push someone with music that wasn't great. I dreamed a dream to astronomical standards where I don't know the statistic behind it, but I gather that Susan Boyle probably has a very, very high selling album in comparison to music history. It's one of those things where when kids will look back at music history and see Susan Boyle's name there somehow that they will go, how did that? happen? How did music like this of a perhaps 55 year old woman from the UK get to the top of the charts and sell hundreds of thousands of records because of the story it's because of the relatability and because people will just feel good from it. And we kind of push aside other things like, do I like this and do I enjoy it? And do I want to listen to it often? I'd love to hear your stories in the comments, wherever you are about something that has impressed upon you that maybe you completely hate or something that's unexpected that you didn't expect to like that you really love now because something in your life experience really impressed it upon you. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Maybe you just find it entertaining and funny that you would never have been in this world, but maybe your partner liked this thing and you went to a gig. Maybe you fell in love with the story of Susan Boyle. Maybe you like Moby like me. Maybe you just wanted to fit in with a cool crowd and like really weird music. Maybe you don't like really weird, weird music because you were listening to the radio and it was all earworms, but I'm intrigued. I think that as much as we hold tight the influences that we have of music in our lives, so many factors go into why we like something. Then I think that we it would be foolish for us to think that 
our thought processes are totally original. I think at the end of the day, most of the dust settles and the stuff that sticks around is the stuff that we actually like. And we tend to brush off the things that we are obsessed with because we lusted over an artist or because the cool person said we liked it. And we find our identity within it all. This has been a little fun exploration and it's kind of been revealing to me about just how much I, my music taste is being influenced by so much that I don't think I even realized. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So please let me know. And that ends the podcast for this week. Do I have an appendix for this week? As I'm recording this, I have, this is my first recording back since being on holidays and need to go back in the flow. And I don't have many podcasts lined up. I did have a backlog of three maximum four at some points and now i'm kind of going week to week so i've got to get that back up i've got to start organizing more interviews with people but for the time being i've got a lot on my plate as you know but i enjoy it very much and it was good to have a holiday and be back amongst it and reflect on life and how i feel about how i'm prioritizing things it's kind of boring but that's the truth anyway i hope you are well thank you for listening to the podcast and i'll see you on the next one